uh, to try out this uh, uh, Shapeways, um, a friend of mine named John Park took a little drawing I did of this little red uh, guy, that I, a little cartoon, cartoon that I like to draw. And he uh, used 3D software to model it in 3D and then uh, put it up on Shapeways and uh, had a couple made. And they turned out to look really cool. He used a kind of a plastic, uh, and uh, I have not painted it yet, but that, that's a, something that I'm going to do later. But they're really, it, it's such a cool service. This kind of toy development was, uh, uh, you know, really expensive before this, having prototype made. And now it's just ridiculous how, how inexpensive it is. Uh, and then CNC, CNC stands for Computer Numerical Control, and it's basically uh, running shop tools so that they're controlled by computer. You have your design on the computer, and the shop tools cut out your part according to your design. Um, the price of these has gone way down. This company called ShopBot, they introduced the new ShopBot Buddy. It's under $8,000, and it cuts uh, uh, wood and plastic and metal. And uh, uh, they've started a project called 100,000 Garages, where they're really encouraging kind of this new uh, idea of America becoming a manufacturing uh, place again. But instead of having these giant centralized factories that churn out stuff, it's going to be distributed all over the country, and people are going to be making cool things in their garages and selling them. <clears throat> just like a company in Oakland uh, called Because We Can. It's just a, a couple, two people, they do it, and they earn a, a really nice living making custom furniture and uh, interior des corporate interior design using uh, shop-bought equipment to make it, and uh, just beautiful stuff. Laser cutters, uh, they remind me of laser printers. Uh, you know, you remember the first laser printers when they came out were six or $7,000. Um, laser cutters are about that price now, and I uh, am certain that uh, in the next few years that price is going to continue to go down, and we will eventually see a $1,000 laser cutter, which allows you to set down any kind of flat material and cut out shapes. And, uh, uh, those shapes can then be snapped together into 3D objects, uh, in, in, uh, Pinoco style. Uh, 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 some friends of mine who live here in New York bought a laser cutter and to, to pay for it, they started offering a service where they would etch people's uh, compu uh, laptop computer tops with any kind of pattern that they wanted and they got enough orders in you know, a matter of a month that they could pay, that, they, that the machine paid for itself and then they they stopped doing that, and then now they're just using it for their own projects. Uh, here, here's a, a company that makes model airplanes, and they use that $7,000 Zing laser cutter to cut all the balsa wood parts, which just cuts the time down to almost nothing. And turn, you know, now he's got a, a, a factory. You know, he's got desktop manufacturing making these model airplane parts um, quickly and inexpensively. Uh, this is uh, a 3D printer. It costs $1,000, and, and the case is laser cut, by the way. Um, it's a company called uh, MakerBot, and they're based here in New York. And what it does is uh, takes any 3D model that you design and prints it out a plastic, the same kind of plastic that a Lego brick is made from. So it's kind of an indestructible plastic. Um, you can see that little white, uh, thread coming off the top. It, it, it's like a spool of, of white plastic, and so they're printing out a little bunny there. And you can really make anything with these things. Um, and uh, at that price, it's a very attractive price. A lot of hobbyists are getting it. Um, and uh, y you can even make uh, a MakerBot out of a MakerBot if you want, which is kind of a scary thing. It's like Skynet coming alive almost. So then, you know, once you make these things and, and you've been funded and you have that, how do you, how do you get them out to the world and, and sell them to people? Um, there are three drivers in that area. There is the rise of online markets. Uh, there are the one-stop service bureaus. And uh, there are people who've kind of gone pro and they're just selling them themselves on, on their own websites and, and doing quite well at it. Um, 
Everyone knows about Etsy. It's a great place for people who make things to sell the things that they've created. This is a, a funny little flash drive that's uh, a little parrot. Uh, Shapeways, I mentioned before, uh, is a great way to have your, your part manufactured and presented to an audience. This is a really cool octopus ring. It's only $25. And Pinoco, like I said, uh, again, another way to get your, your product out there and sold and manufactured. And instead of having to go somewhere and, and uh, have it made, uh, you know, and then marketed, uh, you can do it very inexpensively. Uh, and then the, the Maker Pros, there, there are people who make their own thing and then sell it on their own website, and they've kind of uh, become uh, 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 recognized by enough people that they can make a living doing what they're doing. So, so this is another, another couple, Lenore and Wendell. They have a company called Evil Mad Science. They hooked up with another guy named Bruce Shapiro, and they have this little egg decorating robot uh, that uh, uh, you can design any kind of pattern you want on the computer, and it will draw that pattern onto an egg or a ping pong ball or any other spherical object. It's made from all laser cut parts. They have their own laser cutter, and uh, it's a fun little kit, $200. Adafruit, it's a New York company. Um, they sell electronic kits, and uh, they have a great multi-million dollar business now just because they've become known as uh, these innovators of interesting circuits that you can put into your own uh, creations. And this is a little Nixie tube clock that they sell for $85 with uh, laser cut uh, uh, plastic case. Another company uh, that's going on their own is Backyard Brains. They're uh, a uh, uh, Kickstarter funded organization and it's a way to study the electrical impulses of neurons uh, of insects. And so you can take a cockroach leg, they'll even sell you the cockroach with the kit. You take the cockroach leg and uh, apparently the cockroaches will grow a new leg if you take one off. So they like to trumpet that fact that it's a, a permanent source of cockroach legs. Um, and so you, you, know, you, you put the needles into the leg and you can hear the neuro, neural impulses and you can also plug it into a computer or an iPad and you can see a chart, a, 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 a real-time graph of the activity. And so it's $100 for the kit. And uh, uh, this is something that, that science teachers are buying to teach their kids how to study uh, uh, neural activity. All right, so now I want to talk about really th what, uh, what we're here about is how to create a relationship with these geek communities and, uh, and uh, help them and have them help you. There's three things I think that, that are important to do. You need to understand kind of the DIY mindset. Uh, you need to uh, keep tabs on DIYers and see what they're doing and then uh, partner with the ones that are interesting. So uh, understanding the, the maker mindset, uh, uh, that's an important thing to do. This is a little comic that's in the upcoming issue of, uh, of Make that I, I thought was a good, uh, a good example of what a maker wants. Um, they want a creative relationship with the things that they use every day. They want to have uh, a story with with uh, what with, with what they have, um, uh, so you know I, I make cigar box guitars. Um, I uh, uh, raise bees. I've kept chickens. Uh, all those things. Uh, I have this creative relationship with with my lifestyle, and it's fun to modify the things that I have in my house so that I kind of have this uh, control over my environment. And and in order to have control. You have to have a more active role in, in the things around you. You have, to be, you have to be part of that production cycle and process. And so the other thing that I want is to be able to work with companies that give me things that allow me to innovate with them. And um, we ran this thing called the Maker's Bill of Rights uh, in Make Magazine. And it's kind of a list of things that a smart company 
would do to work with makers. Uh, and on the right here, I have just a few of, of the, the items that I thought were, were interesting. Meaningful and specific parts lists shall be included. Cases shall be easy to open. Special tools are allowed only for darn good reasons. Components, not entire subassemblies, shall be replaceable. If it snaps shut, it, it shall snap open. Screws better than glues. Ease of repair shall be a design ideal, not an afterthought. Schematics shall be included. So we want to encourage do-it-yourself innovation with maker-friendly products. Um, and by having that kind of relationship, it benefits both parties. Um, uh, as an example, uh, a couple of guys came up with this neat little plastic contraption that fits under an iPhone 4, and it screws into a tripod, but it also uh, is a standalone uh, uh, iPhone holder, and so that you can hold the iPhone if you're watching it. It's a really cool gadget, and uh, they didn't ask Apple for permission, and uh, Apple probably doesn't need a lot of marketing help, but imagine some other company that's just uh, has a little tablet device and they want to, to get it around. Could you imagine them working with, uh, with these guys and saying, well, make one of these for us, and uh, you know, it, it will help sell that and it will help those guys. Uh, th these guys sought uh, $10,000 on Kickstarter, and they ended up getting $137,000 in funding for it. Um, uh, most of those are people who, who kicked in more than $20, so they're going to get themselves a free glyph. And I just read last night uh, uh, a couple of guys made a, a, like a watch band for the new iPod uh, Nano. Is that what it is, the Nano with the screen? Um, Anyway, the little square one with the, the, and it looks like a wristwatch. And they were seeking, I think, like ten thousand dollars for the development of it. They ended up getting five hundred thousand dollars for it. So think of those kind of opportunities there, where you can, uh, you know, match a maker with a manufacturer and say, you know, let's partner with something cool, and it, it could go viral on the net. Uh, a fun site to go visit is sugru.com. They make this material. It's an amazing material um, uh, that's like a, it's like, you know, mold, you mold it like clay or Play-Doh, and then it turns into a very hard rubber. And so people use it to, to uh, make things or, or modify or repair the things that they have every day. I've used it to uh, replace the zippers on my suitcase. I fixed my daughter's headphones with it. Um, and I also uh, fixed uh, the dish, uh, I, the wheel on our dishwasher rack broke off, and I, I fixed it with this stuff. It's amazing. So, you know, seeing what, what makers are doing, go to like instructables.com and see what people are making, uh, or go to uh, uh, makezine.com and see the projects there. Uh, as an example of, of, a, of, of uh, DIYers, leading where uh, manufacturers will follow. And, and as a good example of, of how, how companies could partner with innovators, uh, take a look at this. Uh, this is the Ranchilio Silvia. It's a $500 espresso maker. It's a really good espresso maker. I have one. The, uh, the bad thing about it is that it uses a bimetallic thermostat, like almost every espresso maker. And the temperature swing can be about 40 degrees Fahrenheit. And so you really have no control over the temperature of the water, which is a really an important uh, variable that you should lock down when you make espresso. Um, fortunately, the Sylvia is like the most documented espresso maker on the planet. People got a hold of the schematics and the repair manuals, and it's kind of like an, a 57 Chevy or something. You can, you can fix, open the thing with a Phillips head screwdriver. You don't need a special screwdriver. All the parts are easy to access. There's plenty of, of room to get in there and change things around. So eventually, someone came up with the idea of adding a temperature control uh, unit to a Sylvia. This is my machine. Um, and I have what's called a PID temperature control. It's that little box on the left there. And it can control the temperature within one degree of, uh, 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 you know, one degree swing rather than a 40 degree swing. So, that I've locked down that variable when I make espresso. It's a lot better that way.